Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. We're broadcasting live from the fabulously fluoridated capital of Auckland, New Zealand, the island change nation in the sunny slave South Pacific. It's not only fluoridated, it's also chemtrailed and Fukushima irradiated, which is great for the economy because everybody now has a part-time job as an incandescent light bulb. My very special guest today is Randall Carlson from Sacred Geometry International dot info. Randall, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me, Vinny. Now, just glancing at your website, you appear to be quite the prestigious SOB. Ah, uh, yeah, I have pretensions of being such. Hmm, pretensions of being prestigious. This is going to be a great yes. interview. <coughs> well, given my uh, given my you know uh, blue collar working class background, it's most definitely pretense on my part. All right. Well, let's. Uh... Let's get into it then. Could you explain just a little bit about how you got into sacred uh, geometry and more to the point, why you started Sacred Geometry International? Um, first, I'll take your first question, how I got into it. Uh, I would say it went back to the late 60s and early 70s. It seemed like a lot of things trace their uh, genesis back to those days. Um, but uh, it seemed that under uh, certain condition certain um, states of mind, the geometry of the universe seemed to be quite prevalent. Uh, and once those days sort of evolved past, evolved past those days, I became a builder, uh, followed in the footsteps of my father, and I got interested in form and structure. And in looking into the history of the craft that I was attempting to learn, I kept stumbling upon interesting coincidences and interesting tidbits of information about how they used to do things in the old days. And uh, I think, let's see, a, a pivotal point came in the summer of 72 when I was uh, evolved, involved with a, shall we call them a spiritual group. And we were building a couple of Buckminster Fuller domes up in the north woods of Minnesota. And one of them had been designed by an architect uh, to mimic certain geometric patterns in Islamic mosque design. And since myself and a couple of my younger brothers that were involved in the group were the only ones who had carpentry and building experience, since our, our father was in that profession, we got drafted to sort of be the head carpenters on the project. So we built these two geodesic domes, and that got me very interested in the whole uh, subject of alternate building, alternate design, and, and kind of led me into a study of the history of, of architecture then when uh, there was a, the next year a publication came out that featured one of those two domes, that was, we referred to it as the Bindu Dome, and it was a national publication called Shelter that has actually recently been re-released, and it had a full-page spread on this particular project, but th scattered throughout the, the, the book were references to things that were at that time unfamiliar to me. Um, uh, the idea of, of the divine proportion used in medieval architecture, uh, more information on the geometry used by the uh, Islamic builders in their mosques, in their calligraphy, in their rug weaving, and so on. And I think at that point, it kind of led me into an interest in, well, what's going on here? You know, I never heard about any of this, you know, going, going to school. I never heard that there was, you know, principles used universally by these ancient cultures. So I started into a, a in-depth research and pretty much it's been ongoing to this day um, led me into a few years later in the late 70s I en entered the Masonic craft because they kept turning up in my researches uh, over and over again so it began to appear to me that they must have some ha handle on some kind of information so out of curiosity, I went into the craft. I've been an active member ever since, and I did find that, yeah, there's a whole repository of information there, although it's usually not accessed by your run-of-the-mill brother. Um, it's pretty much esoteric only because it's, you know, pretty much being neglected. And that's kind of how I uh, got into the sacred geometry thing. Uh, I think I did my first ever presentation on the subject in 1980. Uh, to a group of people, and of course in 1980, no one really had ever heard of it, uh, and I didn't even call it sacred geometry then, I, um, but I've been off and on ever since I've been doing courses, 
classes, lectures, multimedia presentations. Um, and of course, since then, there's been a tremendous increase in the interest in the subject. So I'm finding myself suddenly being looked upon as being, you know, the go-to man, although I feel like really my, own, my studies of it are only scratching the surface because uh, it's a vast, vast subject that has many applications. So I've been interested, obviously, in the architectural applications, but I quickly discovered as I learned more that it involved um, many other avenues of, of interest, you know, particularly in nature, in biology, in geology, in astronomy. Um, so I found, and then the thing that I've kind of has led me uh, into another aspect of it is we always think of geometry as being a way of describing or measuring space and spatial relationships. Uh, as I begin to work through the various principles and the forms and patterns of sacred geometry, one of the things that seemed to recur over and over again was these, uh, this canon of numbers that somehow seemed to be intrinsic to uh, astronomical measurements, um, architectural measurements, um, the ancient systems of metrology or measurement that were used throughout the ancient world. Uh, from, you know, um, from Cambodia to ancient British Isles to uh, Mesoamerican, uh, Central America, uh, to Egypt. <clears throat> and so there seemed to be a consistent system of metrology or measurement used by many of these ancient cultures that all seemed to be derived from a common geometric pattern. And associated with that were a series of recurrent numbers, which I would call, think, call the canon of sacred numerology or sacred numbers um, that, that we find over and over again embedded in natural processes and in ancient art and architecture. And so one of the most interesting uh, applications I found of these numbers was when I began to look into um, change over long-term periods of time, geological change and historical change, it soon became evident to me that that there were patterns of change as well. It wasn't just a smooth linear progression, but there were definitely episodes of concentrated change, uh, nodal points, if you will, points of discontinuity within the within the, the historical record, within the geological record, and those points of con con discontinuity seem to have an apparent tempo or rhythm to them, and the tempo could be measured by these same exact numbers. And so we find the processional cycle, which is the Earth's third motion, for example, procession of the equinoxes, has a periodicity of about 26,000 years. Well, there was a sacred number used to measure that. Uh, comes right out, straight out of the Vedas and other ancient traditions of 25,920. And when you divide that up, you know, this, this is the model of the great year, which the ancients, was, that was their concept of, of the larger framework of time. Within the great year, just as there is in our, our annual year, there were 12 months, or our 12 months, there were 12 months in the great year, and this is what we've kind of come through pop culture to know as the ages of the world, you know, the, the age of Aries, followed by the age of Pisces, followed by the age of Aquarius. Well, within that cycle of, of, of uh, 26,000 years, there are, there are 12 of these, and they work out to be an average of 2,160 years each. Well, that was a number that was familiar to me from geometry because one of the five regular platonic solids, the cube or the hexahedron, is exactly measured by 2,160 degrees. And then further, when you measure the diameter of the moon, it's 2,160 miles. And so this is just an example of how these, of these redundant relationships described by the same number. And we can go through, and there's a whole, um, I call them a canon of these, of these sacred numbers that recur over and over again. What the ultimate meaning of it is, I'm not exactly sure yet, other than it seems to be a correlation between space and time expressed through these fundamental geometric relationships, which perhaps gives us uh, a means whereby we can have some sense or, or measure of predictability if we know, in other words, the pattern of the past, the pattern within the smooth flow of time when these discontinuities have occurred, and we know that tempo, we can potentially then have a sense of predictability about when could we expect such points of, of concentrated change to occur again. Are you talking about a geometric kind of uh, pattern for, like, prophecy? Uh, yeah. 
I would suggest that. Not, not prophecy as some kind of supernatural phenomena, but prophecy more like this. Um, you know, here in the Northern Hemisphere, every week it's getting a little warmer because it's springtime. Down in New Zealand, you're having, I say, I'll say down under, I don't mean that you're down on a lower status by any means because you're in New Zealand, but you're obviously going into fall time. Well, you know that you can, you have a measure of predictability that it's going to be likely that a month from now, two months from now, your average temperature is going to be considerably, considerably lower than it is right now, right? Nothing supernatural about that. It's just you're familiar with the cyclical change and you know the nature of the, the regularity of the cyclical change. Well, I think what we're talking about here is that there's a larger framework, a larger model of understanding how the world works that suggests that there are temporal changes that occur on a broader scale. So if we know, for example, the quote-unquote season of the great year or the month of the great year, it may give us a sense of predictability. For example, we know that, that the planet frequently shifts back and forth between glacial and interglacial ages. There, you know, there's, there's no um, ambiguity about that anymore. It's well established. You know, that up here in North America, <clears throat> if you look at a map of North America, you'll see that there are no glaciers permanent glaciers other than mountain glaciers anywhere in North America to speak of. However, if we go back 13, 14, 15,000 years ago, about two-thirds of North America was buried under a mile to two-mile thick ice sheet. Well, that's a pretty dramatic change, shifting from that glacial age into the age that we're in now. And if we go back through time, we discover that there has been the entire Pleistocene, roughly the last 2.6 million years, has been characterized by this swinging oscillation of global climate between glacial and interglacial ages. Nobody really has an explanation for that yet. Uh, you know, there's as many different researchers and scientists have looked at it, there's that many different explanations. Um, I think where they've fallen down is that they've basically tried to invoke purely terrestrial mechanisms to, to account for these dramatic swings in global climate, whereas I think the, the source is actually extraterrestrial, personally. But, in a sense, this is the same way. If, if we know that, for example, that the longest interglacial period of the last quarter million years has been 10,000 years, and that we're now currently in, inter, in, an, in an interglacial that's 10,000 years old, well, there may be some sense that maybe within the next millennium or two or century or two, we could expect some a, a shift. So again, nothing supernatural about it. Okay, so it's it's simple like that. It's just to, to do with uh, measurement and time and the effects of planetary bodies and things like that, which is pretty straightforward, you know. But here's the question. How did the ancient peoples know all about this? Did they have modern measurement devices, timekeeping uh, pieces, things of that nature that we've got today? Well, yeah, I think, you, Benny, you've honed in on the fundamental question. And that's the, the, the question that I don't think has been resolved yet. It, it's one of those things where as the years go by, we begin to learn more and more about the capabilities, the understanding of, of these ancient cultures. More and more, we're impressed by the sophistication of their, of their knowledge their, and their, their scientific knowledge. Now, that doesn't necessarily imply that they had a technological society similar to our own. But you've got to bear in mind now, we, we're, we're looking, our species is probably a quarter of a million years old. Now, we've pushed back modern, the age of skeletal discoveries of modern humans to between 150 and 180,000 years. Now, we're talking about modern skeletons. If you look at their, uh, their physiog physiognomy, you look at their anatomy, you look at their cranial capacity, they seem to be every bit the equal of, our, of, of ourselves. Okay, now you've got to think about this. Let's just take conservatively 150,000 years that we modern humans have been walking around on this planet. But our history is only, recorded history is only 5,000 years old. So, you know, we're looking at a 20th or a 30th of the time that we humans have been on the planet Do we actually have a record of. So now, you know, you, you can get into kind of the woo-woo factor here and, and speculate that, you know, there were these advanced civilizations in the past. And, of course, all kinds of cultural traditions would, would suggest such things, whether we're talking about, you know, the, the fall from paradise or Atlantis or Hyperborea or, or any number of, of these myths about a former, you know, the golden age, um, whether we take those literally or not, there is a whole corpus of mythical belief about a, a former order of things that somehow came to an end through whatever means. Now, when we couple that together with the idea that 
Um, there have been enormous changes that have occurred to this planet throughout the time that we humans have been here. I'm talking about just extreme changes, dramatic changes. You know, the old sort of the, the orthodoxy is that, you know, there's this been this smooth continuum from, you know, tens of thousands of years of barbarism up into the pinnacle of modern civilization, which now represents, you know, the, 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 the epitome of whatever humans have accomplished on this planet. Unfortunately, uh, we're, we're coming to break. Uh, but what I find the irony is, is that although time's moving forward, humanity seems to be in a lot of ways moving very, very quickly backwards. <laughs> I uh, agree with that, yeah. Manny. Yes. Yeah. And we'll be right, right back, ladies and gentlemen, with Randall Carlson from Sacred Geometry International Info. There's an awful lot of videos there, documentaries, and even classes that you can take, ladies and gentlemen so that's sacred geometry international dot info back in a minute welcome ladies and gentlemen to the vinnie eastwood show uh, you can listen in live on the homepage at the vinnie eastwood show.com also the archives to our radio programs my radio programs american freedom radio's radio programs man you're saying how many radio programs can i mention in a sentence it <clears throat> At thevinnieeastwoodshow.com and americanfreedomradio.com, there are archive sections are plenty, and I advise you to check them out. Usually when we have a guest on a webcam uh, on this broadcast, we try to... I try to make my guests cackle a little bit. You know, just 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 a little bit of cackling. It, it makes the world go round, I reckon. A few laughs while we're talking about how we're getting exterminated and enslaved by ruthless criminal sociopathic scumbags. You know? I reckon that's a good idea. So I take a little snapshot of uh, the person whilst in the middle of uh, a righteous cackle. And uh, that becomes the little picture of them for the podcast. And I think that if you go to the com forward slash 2013.html, uh, you can just scroll down and just have a look at the vast, massive array of guests that we have had on this show all of which seem to be enjoying themselves. And if you like the this format, uh, it's very, very uh, difficult to get any sort of uh, income, sponsorship, th things of that nature uh, with this uh, particular approach. So if you can, please do go to the VinnieEastwoodShow.com homepage and uh, donate either through the PayPal or the bank account number that's there preferably uh, setting up an automatic payment through the subscription button that is there too. You can get a commercial free archives that for uh, $1 a month or $5 a month or 10 or 20 however much you feel. Just so that we can keep everything running, keep all these wonderful guests coming to you day by day, giving you incredible, intense, fabulous, life-changing information without actually charging anybody anything. It's all about, I'll give you whatever you want, and if you want to give me something back, please do. And I very much appreciate all the support that we've received at the Vinnie Eastwood Show so far. Uh, coming up on three years of broadcasting. Not bad for a little young kid from New Zealand, I think. My very special guest is Randall Carver from Sacred Geometry International Info. Randall, welcome back. Uh, now, the element that we were talking about was how exactly the uh, the ancients knew about all of these uh, different uh, rafts of time and uh, geometry and uh, various other elements. What I found very interesting about the uh, the pyramids is that they're they're, they're made of stone, and uh, they it, it, pyramids produce this really interesting energy. Like they they've done this uh, pyramid experiment in Russia where they've created a plastic pyramid, and they've put uh, like a milliliter of water in there and then they've given that milliliter of water to kids who are sick or something and suddenly they get better uh and various other miraculous things and they've never been able to accomplish that with a steel or metal structure for some reason you can't do it with uh metallics and the pyramids are made of stone and i thought that was very interesting how did they know that well i'm not familiar with that work Vinny. um and I've never heard of using plastic. So this is something new I've now that I'm going to have to check out. Um, well, uh, David Wilcock had yeah. been talking about it. I think uh, he came on a tour here to New Zealand. That was one of the parts of his presentation, which I found intensely interesting. But if it's uh -huh. not one of the elements of your experience, then, uh, well, 
basically well, take I've it wherever you like. Certainly been interested in the pyramids from a geometric standpoint and from an architectural standpoint and an engineering standpoint. Um, you know, my one take on the, the the Great Pyramid, particularly because I've examined the the geometry of it inside and out, is that um, you know it, it manifests a very unique geometric relationship between a circle and a square in that um, if you take the, the height of the pyramid, and this would be a pyramid reconstructed using the, uh, the angle of slope to base measured from the existing, uh, the still existing casing stones of 51 degrees, 51 minutes, give or take a minute or two of, of arc. If you take the height of the pyramid, uh, which would be just at 482 feet, and draw a circle using that as the radius, then that circumference of that circle will be precisely the same as the perimeter of the pyramid's square base. So it provides a solution to one of the classical problems of, of geometry, uh, which was the squaring of the circle, the attempt to draw square and circle of equal perimeter using only the, uh, the implements of classical geometry, which was a compass and an unmarked straight edge. Because it was believed if you could create a geometric form with a compass and an um, unmarked straight edge, you could duplicate that process on a building site by using a sharpened pole stuck in the ground and using a straight line, either as a fixed line or as the radius of a circle with which you could draw arcs. Um, there's a lot more going on with the pyramid than that, but that, in terms of its geometry, is, is an interesting relationship. Also, um, it just so happens that the, um, if you take the angle of the pyramid's apothem, which is the, uh, the measurement from the center of the pyramid's base up to its apex, and place that over the half the base, it's the golden section, the famous golden section, which is roughly 1.618. Um, also, the, the, the limit of what's known as the Fibonacci series or Fibonacci sequence. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting things going on geometrically there. Um, and then geodetically, it's interesting, too, because, um, and this is very difficult to explain over, over you know, without graphics and visuals. Um, and, in, and I go extensively into this in my, my DVD, actually, where we've got some very cool animations and graphics to show how the Great Pyramid of Khufu was a, a model of the Northern Hemisphere. Actually, it could be a model of the Southern Hemisphere, but it encodes within it um, very precise and sophisticated geodetic information, um, which is demonstrable to a point, I think, beyond any pale of coincidence. Um, but again, it would be very difficult to explain w without reliance on, on the visuals that I, that I use to explain it. But you have to understand that the Earth spinning on its axis is not a perfect sphere. You, you, you understood that, right? You know that the equatorial diameter is larger than the polar diameter because as it spins on its axis, the, the, the mass, the plastic mass of the Earth migrates towards the equator. And so the equatorial diameter of the Earth is 26 miles greater than the polar diameter. And this equatorial bulge, it's, it's a good thing that it's there because it helps to keep the Earth stable in its orbit. Without that equatorial bulge, the Earth would be free to um, be much more chaotic in its orbital motion. Well, there's, um, there's a part of the... The sea level there, I believe, along the equator is on average about 500 metres or so larger than, say, the sea level in London. It is. I don't think it's that much. Um, but it is definitely, yeah, but for the same reason, because the, the, the fluid oceans are migrate towards the equator because of that centrifugal throw caused by the Earth spinning on its axis, the same way that the plastic mass of the Earth does. Um, but what that means is that when you measure, for example, a square degree of, of latitude and longitude, let's say at the equator, there's going to be a difference between those two. And if you take them and you look at that difference, that difference is actually encoded into the geometry of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I guess the best I can do is, since we don't have visuals for a radio broadcast, I have extensive visuals and, and graphics in the DVD to show exactly how this was accomplished. Mm. But that brings us back to your, your question again. Um, oh, I also mentioned that the, the video of that, I've just been informed, is available on the website. So if somebody goes to the website, sacredgeometryinternational.com, um, there should be a video describing or, or showing what I've just been attempting to describe. 
But it does bring us back to the issue that the question you asked earlier is how would ancient peoples have known some of this? In other words, assuming that this isn't just some ridiculous, unsubstantial claim that I'm making that, that the Great Pyramid includes the very precise geodetic information about the size and shape of the Earth, assuming that's not just some woo-woo claim, then it does, of course, raise the question of how would somebody have known that? And one of the things that I do in, in, the, in the DVD presentation is I basically show all of the geodetic surveys that have been done actually going back to the 1800s, coming right down to our, our satellite surveys to show how our act, the accuracy of the um, dimensions of the Earth has improved with our ability to um, utilize satellites. Um, anyways, when we, when we talk about the pyramid, <clears throat> there's a, if we were to basically enlarge the pyramid, by a scale, scaling factor of 43,200. And this is getting back to one of those sacred numbers that I was talking about earlier. 43,200. Half of that is 21,600. Remember I mentioned the number 2,160? Yeah. Remember earlier in the first segment I talked about the, the, the diameter of the moon, the, the angular measure of a hexahedron, um, the number of years in a, in a month or a platonic uh, epoch of the great year, um, well, 21,600, if we raise that number by uh, a power of 10, we have 21,600. That's basically the number of minutes of arc in the, in the uh, circumference of the Earth, and it's also the number of nautical miles in the measure of the Earth. If we double that number, we get 43,200. Now, if we take the present Great Pyramid of Khufu, enlarge it by precisely 43,200 times, scale it up, its square base is going to be exactly then equivalent to the round circumference of the Earth's equator. And that's the scaling factor, 43,200. The height of the pyramid, right at 481 point something feet, times 43,200, will be the Earth's polar radius. So it's this remarkable coincidence that, again, uh, it's best understood seeing the visuals, the graphics of it, which I, you can see actually on the website if you go there. We have a we have a, an extensive dissertation about that because it, it's in the, in the DVD. Well, again, so that brings us back to this question, that assuming that I'm not full of it here, and that they really did accomplish this, how did they know that? And that was the question you posed just before the break. How would they have had access to this information? And th what I was then describing was the fact that, you know, we humans with presumably equivalent intelligence to our own, modern, you know, scientific, highly technologically advanced humans, um, we have no reason to believe that the people of 50,000 years ago would have been any less intelligent based upon, you know, the size of their cranial capacity and so forth. Um, so the question then becomes is, is why did it take so long for us to emerge from barbarism from so many tens of thousands of years of, of, of a hunter-gatherer existence into actually figuring out things like how to write, how to build cities, you know, how to, how, how to keep a record of things. And, you know, that's a fair question. And, and I think sort of historical orthodoxy has assumed that previous to recorded history, we basically had, you know, we went from the Bronze Age back to the, the Neolithic or New Stone Age, from the Neolithic to the Mesolithic, which was the Middle Stone Age. And then, you know, the, the Neolithic lasted a couple thousand years, the Mesolithic lasted a few thousand years, then we get into the Paleolithic, and the Paleolithic is lasting for tens of thousands of years. In other words, the old Stone Age. Well, see, I think it's fair to call that whole model into question. And when we think about, you know, think about, Vinny, how, how much we've presumably progressed, at least in a technological sense, in the last, say, 300 years, since the time of the Renaissance or since the time of the scientific enlightenment, how far we've progressed just since the dawn of the 20th century. You know, when my, my grandfather never tired of telling me, you know, when I was a kid growing up, well, there was no airplanes when I was a kid and no automobiles, you know, just like now I'm telling kids, well, nobody had personal computers or cell phones when I was a kid. There was no Internet, you know. When you just begin to think about how far we progress just in a century, well, let's assume that some global catastrophe comes along and eliminates our, uh, our advanced society and we have to start all over again with a Stone Age existence. 10,000 years from now, how much record would there be of our little experiment in, in, uh, in advanced industrial, technological, scientific civilization? 
You know, it could a few centuries could easily get swallowed up and disappear. Mm -hmm. And so when we consider the fact that there was 100,000 or 150,000 years of human history that, of which there is no record, my point is, is that who knows what heights of evolutionary, you know, social evolutionary development we could have obtained during that interval. Then the, quest, the, the, the question that's, that raises is, well, why is there no record? And of course, what I would say to that is simply this, that it's only in the last two to three to four decades that we've come to understand how truly catastrophic the history of this planet has been. Not over, just over the long term of millions of years, but also over the much shorter term of a few thousand to a few tens of thousands of years. And if you think human beings, let's say we've been around 150, modern humans, homo sapiens sapiens, been around 150, 180,000 years. Well, we've had at least four to six full-blown glacial ages that have come and gone in that period of time. Now, you think about a glacial age coming on, what happens? Seven, six to seven million cubic square miles of the Earth's surface is swallowed up under perennially frozen glacial ice. Mm -hmm. Sea level drops by 400 feet worldwide. There are enormous climatic changes and environmental changes as a consequence of that. Right, well we're coming to break now and I would like to indeed go over this uh, abrupt kind of uh, climate shift that we're talking about and the, the glacial movements when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, with Randall Carver from sacredgeometryinternational.info. You're listening to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. Back in a minute. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show, broadcasting live on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. I'm here with Randall Carlson, which means son of Carl, apparently. I haven't double checked yes. that fact. Right again. <laughs> Welcome back, Randall. Where oh, were I'm you? I'm glad to be back. Where was I? Yeah. I went out to tell the guy routing, operating a router to shut up. Operating a router? Like, I, I presume it's not an We're... Ethernet router. No, this is the old. We're uh, the woodworking router. We're restoring a canoe. Restoring a canoe. You know what's yeah. interesting? As um, as that was happening, I was thinking about an old joke uh, uh, that I made up. Uh, the Māori word for food is kai, and I thought about making a, uh, a, a Māori food TV show called Kai Yakking. Oh, yeah. And incidentally, you're in the background working on a canoe while I'm thinking about Kai Yakking. Yes. Well, of course, this had uh, two paddlers in it, not a single. This was tandem. It's a racing canoe. That was something I did back in the old days, in my youth. Mm, mm, in my youth. Being from Minnesota, I don't know if you know Minnesota. Minnesota is a state we have here in the U.S. Is that when all the? Is that a it? place where all the sodas are really small? Uh, yeah. Well, you could <laughs> you could look at it that way. It's most well known for its uh, many many lakes, fifteen thousand lakes, because. Well, getting back to this whole question we were talking about earlier with glacial and interglacial ages, most of Minnesota was buried under glacial ice. And the 15,000 lakes are the puddles left over from the melting away of the great mass of glacial ice. So I, I mostly grew up on, one of the, on the shores of one of these little glacial lakes. And that actually is one of the reasons I sort of got interested in things like ice ages in the first place knowing that where I had lived was uh, had once been under thousands of feet of ice. Not so long ago, actually. So, right, And how does that actually relate to uh, uh, geometry and, and things of that nature? Because there was the other element here, too, where you're studying sacred geometry, you know, sacredgeometryinternational.info, obviously, and I saw that there was a section on there on geology, how does, geo how does geometry relate to geology? Well, uh, what's the common factor there between geometry and geology? The earth, right? One is the science of the earth and the other is the measurement of the earth. So ultimately, there must be some kind of a connection there, etymologically speaking, right? Mm. Well, it gets back to what I was saying in that, that um, in the first uh discussion we were having about the, the canon of sacred numbers. Uh, again, it's because when I start looking at these numbers related to geometric forms, uh, I find these numbers that are also embedded in the geological record, curiously enough. And a geological record, you might think of as being a, um, a record of 
temporal change changes through time. Um, and one of the important insights here is that basically there are two modes of global change. The mode that we're in now, which is basically uniform, uh, gradualistic, you know, we can, it's pretty predictable. You know, we expect that when you get up in the morning, the sun's going to be rising. You're going to expect the seasons to change. You know, you expect winter is going to be followed by a thawing of spring, and you expect that the hot, the heat of summer is going to be followed by the cooling of autumn and so forth. And this is all quite predictable. Well, bear in mind now that when you are uh, talking about the onset of a glacial age, all that predictability goes out the window. And this, it, it, it's not too much of an exaggeration to describe the onset of a glacial age like this. Uh, imagine that, you know, at least, again, I'll reference because I'm coming from the northern hemisphere, but um, I imagine you, you get snowfall. Are you on the south or north island? I'm on the North Island. I will, I will never uh, go back living in the South Island. When I was a student, I watched my olive oil freeze at room temperature. That was enough. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. Okay, so you've had that experience of cold winters then, living on the South Island. Well, you know, interestingly enough, it wasn't that cold. It's just that the house was designed to insulate the cold rather than the heat. So it was on average five, oh. de five degrees colder inside in a Scottish-built home in Dunedin in New Zealand. Oh, okay. Did you have snowfall? Yeah, we had snowfall once uh, while we were down there, and the snow was still on the lawn six months later because we got about 30 minutes of sunshine in the morning every day, and it didn't manage to uh, defrost that yeah. stuff. Okay. Well, now, okay, so where I grew up in Minnesota, we would it was not unusual to have four, five, six feet of snow on the ground by, you know, by March. By the time thaw, spring thaw came around, any case, here's kind of how the analogy that I use. You know, you, you get a, a compaction ratio. You start out with a certain footage of snow, and you basically compress it to about, you know, about half to three quarters of its of its density when it's snowfall, and then it's compressed into glacial ice. And you got a picture now that over central Canada, around 15,000 years ago, the glacial ice might have been as much as two miles thick. Two miles thick. I mean, that's... Where now, of course, it's forests growing and, you know, moose and black bear and, you know, beaver and lots of wildlife living. And, you know, there are communities and villages and towns. But 15,000 years ago, you had thousands of feet of ice. Well, the onset of a glacial age is apparently not a long, drawn out, gradual affair. It's something that happens quite abruptly. And it can literally, you can think of it this way, imagine that uh, you go from summer into autumn and then from autumn into winter, except that that spring doesn't come then for 15,000 years. And that's essentially what the onset of a glacial age is like. And that has happened repeatedly through the history of the Earth, and it's happened multiple times in the last couple of million years. And then, like I mentioned earlier, nobody really has an explanation for that. So yeah. you're talking about kind of like seasons within seasons? Seasons within seasons. Or in Ezekiel's terminology, wheels within wheels. Yes, seasons within seasons is a good way of putting it. And so, what got you, what interested me is that you know these were in a sense two parallel interests. Um, I spent a lot of time outdoors growing up, a lot of time exploring, hiking, camping, that sort of thing. As an adult, I've always enjoyed the outdoors, the natural world. Uh, so I've just cultivated an interest in things like geology and astronomy, things like that. That you know, you can't avoid when you're when you're out in in the the world of nature, and um, I at some point I began to realize that um, you know that this mode of change, this gradualistic mode of change, which geologists refer to as uniformitarianism, that's a mouthful for you, but that's basically the 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 concept that we try to understand all Earth change by reference to things that are going on in the world around us now, and which is a very useful construct for understanding ancient global change, um, except the problem comes in when it becomes dogmatic and then you assume that, well, nothing that's, there's nothing that's happening now, uh, anything that's happening now, you know, it couldn't have happened any differently in the past. So we attempt to try to fit ex the explanation for all past global changes into this straitjacket of, of modern change. Well, the, 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 counterpart to gradualism is catastrophism. And catastrophism was the prevailing way of understanding the history of the earth 
at the beginning of geology as a science in the early 19th century. And it got supplanted by, um, by the gradualistic paradigm, which then became entrenched as dogma by the time we get to the 20th century. So that anybody who started talking catastrophes, well, they must be trying to get us back to biblical fundamentalism and Noah's flood and this sort of thing. And so catastrophe or any discussion of catastrophe fell out of favor for most of the 20th century. The last two to three decades of the 20th century, though, that began to change dramatically. Primarily, the thing that, that pushed the pendulum the other way was the discovery that uh, the dinosaurs had probably been uh, exterminated 65 million years ago when a giant asteroid slammed into the Earth moving at you know, 20 or 30,000 miles an hour, releasing you know, a couple of hundred million megatons of energy into the Earth's uh, environment and probably triggering a whole host of associated changes, seismic activity and volcanic activity and climate activity and so forth. And that sort of opened the door to discussing catastrophism again as a, as a respectable subject and not just something that was for the crackpots and the fringe uh, element. Well, it's certainly, it's, something, it's, it's certainly something for the climate change uh, element, isn't it? Well, getting into that, you know, I mean, that's... See, here's the thing you've got to understand, Vinny. When a modern environmental movement was born in the late 60s, the gradualistic paradigm reigned supreme. And so when you assume that the history of the Earth has been this long, smooth continuum with very, very few blips in the, in the, the waveform of change until humans came along with their nasty old industry and capitalism and so forth, you know, the assumption was is that nothing much had really perturb the, the serenity of, of global change until humans came along. But since then, I mean, that paradigm has been completely turned on its head. And the problem is, is that the environmental movement is still stuck back in the gradualistic paradigm, and they haven't kept up with the changes uh, in thinking that have occurred that really demonstrate now unequivocally that the history of the Earth has been profoundly catastrophic. And some of these... Uh, episodes of global change have been so far beyond anything that we have yet uh, imposed on the earth that it's really almost ludicrous. You know, one of the claims that's frequently being made now is that we're in the midst of the sixth great mass extinction. And um, well, see, getting some well I think that's actually a good place to leave the first hour. The sixth oh. great mass extinction. <laughs> I'm going to actually type that one down and, uh, and, and, and bring it up when we come back. Um, you know, what, I, what occurs to me is that even if we were going through a sixth great mass extinction, as they're talking about, I think this is the first man-made one, right? Because, you know, you've got like, all these species dying off everywhere, all our food's contaminated with pesticides, all our water's got fluoride all through it, been chemtrailed every single frickin' day, we've got Fukushima radiation and Chernobyl uh, stuff all over the place. You know, hey, we're trying to kill ourselves. Or maybe... Somebody's trying to kill us. We'll be right back after the break at the VinnieEastwoodShow.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of the fastest two hours in talk radio. It's the Vinnie Eastwood Show, the lighter side of genocide. Because of the world's so full of chaos and madness, if you lose your sense of humour, you go freaking nuts. A very special guest is Randall Carlson from <coughs> SacredGeometryInternational.info. And uh, where we left off, you were talking about the, uh, the, 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 the alleged fraud of the, uh, the, 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 the sixth great mass extinction, were you? Well, I didn't, I didn't use the word fraud, but... Hence, you know, that's, I, I think, that's why I used the word alleged. Oh, okay. Well, I think what's important is that we place it into context. And... When we talk about mass extinctions, they say the sixth great mass extinction is referring that there are previously five great mass extinctions. And, um, of course, the worst was the um, Permian-Triassic extinction of 245 million years ago, followed by an extinction in the Ordovician period, another one in the, at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, which is probably the most famous, which is the uh, 65 million year ago event where the actually closer to 66 million were the dinosaurs and the great ammonites and things. It was a, it was a global extinction episode in which roughly 75% of all species disappeared in a very short period of time um, in terms of geological time. <clears throat> and 
when we talk about now we're in the middle of the sixth great mass extinction, the assumption is that what's going on now is comparable in severity and magnitude to the previous five. Now, I should say that the, the most famous one, the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction, is, is generally considered the third within the, the lineup of severity. Um, so right in the middle, right? Now, as it stands now, um, you know, there are a lot of assumptions about how many species are going extinct, but it doesn't really, it's not really based on actual species counts. It's based upon assumptions of how many unknown species there are living in how many hectares of habitat that are potentially or theoretically destroyed each year. And so it's a completely hypothetical number based upon computer models. It's not actually based upon any counting of, of actual species mortality. If you don't count island extinctions, and certainly, you know, New Zealand would, is, is generally included in the uh, anthropogenic extinction models because, you know, you had the giant flightless moa birds there, and the uh, blame for their extinction is usually placed upon the arrival of, of uh, the Maori people some 800 years ago. Um, because there's, there's associated with the, uh, the geological horizon at which the moas disappear, there's also abundant charcoal. Now, charcoal is usually attributed to fires, human-induced fires. Well, though if you actually talk to the Maori people themselves, they're not going to accept blame for the extinction of the, the moa birds. They basically have legends about fire coming from the sky. And um, I actually am more inclined personally to believe the traditions of the Maori rather than the archaeologists or the paleontologists or the zoologists that because they see this layer of charcoal, they assume that that was that essentially the, the Maoris arrived, hunted all the moa birds to extinction in a in overnight and set fire to all the vegetation of the island for whatever reason. Just doesn't make sense. Doesn't just doesn't make sense. If anybody's right? ever been out in the New Zealand bush lighting a single fire in any way, shape or form, trying to find enough dry stuff to get that is freaking impossible. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that straight, you know, straight from your, from uh, from the mouth of an indigenous person there, my, because that's what I had sort of guessed actually to be the case. Uh, yeah, it's like yeah, let's they, burn down the rainforest. Brilliant idea, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, let's completely, you know, um, sabotage our own possibility of any kind of economic future at all. Here, we'll just destroy the the whole infrastructure of our society. Just Although for the. For the when the settlers came in, they did do a heck of a lot of burning to clear farmland. Yes, yes, I, I, this I, I'm apparently aware of, and and the question is, is can we then now extrapolate backwards and assume that the arrival of the Maori people 800 years ago did the same thing? I think they were primarily hunters rather than farmers, so um, I don't know if they would had any incentive to clear lots and lots of farmland. But in any case. Going from you know New Zealand to you know other island extinctions like Madagascar, for example, it's generally assumed, without any real hard empirical evidence, that it was the arrival of humans. Um, we see that the last mass extinction in Earth history, which was at the end of the Pleistocene, thirteen thousand years ago, when all of the megafauna disappeared. Um, now, of course, you had you had a tremendous bestiary of megafauna in Australia that went extinct. Uh, about 20,000 years earlier than the uh, megafauna in the rest of the world that went extinct. Mm -hmm. And this is, it sometimes has been blamed on the arrival of the Aboriginal peoples, which again, I don't believe because Aboriginal peoples have their own traditions about what caused the extinction of the Australian megafauna. And again, I, without going into the details on it, I strongly suspect and believe that it was a natural catastrophic episode rather than anything that the humans did. If humans had a role in it, it may have been only finishing off surviving species uh, in the aftermath of a catastrophe. Uh, likewise, you know, in, in the northern hemisphere, there was about 120 species of, of mega mammals that went extinct at the end of the last ice age. You know, you probably, you know, are, know that there were woolly mammoths. You know, North America here, we had four, we had more elephants in North America than Africa does now. And that's kind of bizarre when you think about it. Um, there were mastodons and, and four different species of woolly mammoths. So there was actually five species of proboscideans in North America prior to the end of the last ice age. There were giant ground sloths. There were 
giant cave bears. There were saber-toothed cats. There were beavers that weighed five, 600 pounds. The list went on and on and on and on, about 120, 125 species. Well, come between 11 and 13,000 years ago, all of those species went extinct. Woolly mammoths went extinct over the entire globe. Mastodons did as well. Mastodons ranged all the way into South America. They went extinct. The, the I have a different been... theory. I believe, what is your theory, I believe that the woolly mammoths and the uh, incredibly slow sloths bred together and evolved into the modern obese American culture. Uh well, you know, there, you may have something there. You know, I, I basically look at uh, the, the present incarnation of our government and the, the, the nearest uh, creature that I can liken to describe by analogy what, what our present government has evolved into is Jabba the Hutt from the old Star Wars. And, um, you know, perhaps when a creature like that becomes so slothful it can no longer move, you know, things change, it can't adapt. I, I definitely think there's analogies here between what goes on in nature and what goes on in society. Um, well, people think case, that that uh, society is detached from nature because we're not living in the bush or something. You know, we're not natural creatures or something like that. But the same thing that affects the world uh, and all the creatures and it affects us too. And why wouldn't we follow the same does. patterns? Of course it does. And of course, we have built our advanced industrial society when in an interval of relatively... Uh, calm climate and environmental change and see there's my point here that i'm trying to make is there's we can't take anything for granted and i was trying i guess getting back to this the question here which which we're kind of digressing from somewhat but but still it pertains to the question of this sixth grade mass extinction so my point is that if we actually count the number of species not counting the species that have disappeared on islands because i think that's questionable i don't think we can just without any further critical thought, blame all that on humans, the arrival of humans, every time we see an island extinction. But if we actually count the number of species that, that we know of that have, have gone extinct as a result of our activities, it's, it's probably only about a dozen, about a dozen species. Um, you know, a lot of the Can I ask, here, is this yeah. part of the environmental movement as well to demonize man as a cancer on the planet by, by blaming us for everything that happens? By blaming us for everything, absolutely, absolutely. And like I said before, it has its roots within, you know, the, 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 the prevailing paradigm at the time that the environmental movement began in the late 60s and early 70s was strictly gradualistic. See, nobody at back then was thinking about the fact that, you know, maybe every few thousand years the planet might get struck by an asteroid. Or, you know, a gigantic volcanic eruption that spews, you know, 500 cubic kilometers of ash into the atmosphere. Um, people just weren't thinking along those lines. They were basically thinking that, that the history of the Earth had been generally pretty quiet, calm, peaceful, gradual, uniform, until humans came along to upset the balance of nature, see? And that paradigm still dominates environmentalist thinking. And I have conversations all the time with him. I read a lot of him. I still, in, a, in, a, in my own way, think of myself as an environmentalist. But I'm now realizing and have realized for 20-some years now that there are factors, much bigger players in the environmental stability of this planet than what anything we humans have yet contributed to it. And let me put this into perspective. We talk about the, the sixth great mass extinction. We'll take the, the middle one, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary extinction of 65 million years ago. We know that the Earth got struck by at least one asteroid. I mean, that's equivocally de unequivocally demonstrated. The asteroid has struck the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. It left a crater 150 to 180 miles in diameter. The object was about six miles in diameter. It was probably moving 25 to 30,000 miles per hour when it hit. Um, when an object like that strikes the Earth, that, in that particular case, it released explosive energy equivalent to a couple of hundred million megatons. Now, to put that in perspective, think about it, at the height of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, late 60s, early 70s, the total nuclear arsenals of both sides was between 10 and 12,000 megatons. I'll say that again, between 10 and 12,000 megatons, right? Now, imagine what kind of environmental havoc and social havoc would have been wrought had we engaged in an all-out thermonuclear war back then. 
Imagine that we unleashed all of the thousands of nuclear warheads on both sides, raining down on the cities, um, you know, creating, you know, thousands of nuclear explosions. The total amount of energy released into the global environment would have been, in round numbers, about 10,000 megatons. The asteroid that struck the Yucatan Peninsula released energy on the order of 200 million megatons. Think about that. Okay, now, when that happened, you had most of the vegetation on planet Earth burned up. You had seismic events all over the planet that were perhaps measured in 10 to 11 on the Richter scale. You had outpouring of tremendous amounts, you know, tens of thousands of cubic miles of, of bas basaltic lava in, uh, in India, the Deccan Traps, which released huge, huge amounts of sulfur into the atmosphere, poisoning the atmosphere. Yet it's likely, according to some studies, that for a while the rainfall that was happening globally may have had the pH of acid, of battery acid. You know, you would have had the skies darkened for years. Now, you think about that, and, and, and there's now evidence that possibly there was a second great impact into the Indian Ocean. Indian geologists have discovered a huge crater, even bigger than the one that's in the Yucatan, that appears to be on the bottom of the Indian Ocean, that also looks like it's dating to the Cretaceous tertiary boundary of 66 million years ago. Plus, there were at least half a dozen smaller impacts around the globe that are also dating to that same period. Now, you think about that. Think about, you know, a couple of hundred million megatons of energy. You're talking about on the order of 10 billion Hiroshima bombs, to try to put that in perspective. The bomb that completely obliterated Hiroshima. Think about 10 billion of those. I mean, you can't even conceive of that. Now, that was one of the five great mass extinctions that occur. The question is, on the part of a, a lot of paleontologists is really, how did anything survive the, 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 uh, you know, the severe consequences of that event? Well, when I look out my window today, things look pretty calm and placid out there. The sun is shining, the birds are chirping, you know, um, there are beautiful blue sky, clouds are in the sky. I mean, there may be some chemtrails up there, but, but nonetheless, Things look pretty calm, and I'm pretty confident that, you know, tomorrow morning it's going to be another day similar to this. We may get some rainfall tomorrow, you know, and it's going to be probably a hot summer like it always is here in the, you know, southern America. But nonetheless, there's nothing going on out there that would be equivalent to all of the vegetation on Earth burning down. Nothing like a cosmic winter being superimposed in the aftermath of that. Nothing like, um, you know two or three or four or five years of almost total darkness around the planet from all of the soot and the ash in the atmosphere. Nothing like the, you know, the thousands of cubic miles of dirt and ash that's filling the atmosphere as a result of the impact itself. So when you think of it in that context, I mean, how do we say that what's going on now is comparable to an event like that? I personally think it's ludicrous. Well, you know, again, uh, the whole environmental movement is uh, essentially just designed to make humanity the enemy. And as far as I know from the one of the founders of the environmental movement who went on to uh, create Sea Shepherd, he, he separated from that whole green movement thing uh, because he saw that it was being infiltrated and uh, being taken over and becoming under the control of people who were essentially just hardcore communists. And if people are the enemy... <laughs> What's the solution to that? Exterminate everybody? I think a communist uh, dictatorship would probably be up to the task, don't you? I would. I think I would concur completely with that. And, and yes, it's true. I, I think that what has happened is the science of environmentalism has been replaced by the politics of environmentalism. Mm. And, and I don't think at this point the political environmentalists are actually doing any good for the environment at all. I mean, it's a political agenda of control, um, they're still laboring under this misconception that, you know, what we're doing to the earth is something just unprecedented in its severity and its destructiveness. But they're refusing to look at, you know, the scientific data that's there now that, you know, I, you know, when I, I get into uh, discussions, debates with um, folks quite frequently on this question, because I've been fairly public in my expressing my opinions on it. So I, I get challenged when I say that, you know, global warming isn't all it's hacked up to be, you know, that yes, there's probably an element of truth to that. I certainly believe that by adding 100 parts per million of 
carbon dioxide to the atmosphere would probably increase the temperature of the planet by maybe a quarter of a degree in a hundred years. But I think that the, you know, basically it's, it's been the whole question again, has been hijacked to serve a political agenda of, of basically human control. Yeah. Um, well, that seems to be the, uh, it's the story of the 20th century, and uh, if, if you look back, it's the story of human existence. Somebody's always trying to hijack and use a crisis for their own ends. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome, everybody, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. My very special guest is Randall Carlson from Sacred Geometry International.info. Now, we were talking about the, um, the the climate change movement on the time, and um, if you want to see a uh, video of us having a bit of an altercation uh, with what I've come to call climate cultists, you can go to uh, my YouTube channel, Mr. News Guerrilla Media, and just Google and just have a look through the videos for climate change. We've done a lot of work um, exposing the fraud and the scumbaggery inherent in that, but the one particular one where we actually kind of... Uh, practically get assaulted by these people um is called i think climate change death cult morons i wanted to i wanted to have something that was neutral you know and not overly offensive as a title <clears throat> so anyway randall welcome back i'm still here okay cool i, I didn't run off in a panic <laughs> thank goodness i'm not always playing hardball here yeah yeah oh my god the climate's changing you mean, uh, right. <laughs> well, I remember somebody thing, asked me one time, actually, oh, you don't believe that climate change is real. No, I believe it's real. It's been happening for four billion years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, see, well, again, see, here's what's happened. The debate has been hijacked. When, when the, the climate seems to have leveled off 10 years ago and not really warmed since then, according to all of the temperature monitoring stations, um, you know, they, they basically changed the term. They, they, they moved the goalpost by saying, well, we won't refer to it as global warming anymore. We'll refer to it as climate change. And then anybody who questioned the dogma of global warming was then labeled a climate change denier. And, you know, in reading through the literature of, of climate change by the wide variety of climate-related sciences, of which there are, you know, hundreds. I actually have several thousand articles in my archives going back decades and decades. I couldn't produce one single quote-unquote climate scientist or scientist in a related field who didn't believe that the climate was changing. Of course the climate is changing. It's always been changing. Yeah, I, and, got, I got called a climate denier once and I said, no, I'm not. I never denied there was a climate. <laughs> yeah, you know, you did. Yeah. Last time I looked out my window, there was a climate out there. I mean, bro. Um, <laughs> Now, you know, and see, here's the thing. That's not to say that, you know, we should just proceed with utter impunity to, you know, the way we conduct our affairs in the natural world. Of course not. But, but what these me, people are doing, what are these people are doing, Randall, is they're ignoring all the real environmental issues in favor of one that gives them a political agenda to create a world government. I mean, that's basically the, um, the crux of the issue here. Uh, for me, is that they ignore mercury, they ignore fluoride, they ignore pesticides. I mean, look, the amount of cancer that people are already getting in, in around, what, one in three, one in two in New Zealand that people mm -hmm. get cancer, okay? Environmentalists aren't talking about uh, any of the causality factors with that within our food or anything. They're like, no, 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 no. The only important thing is this climate change thing that's been completely made up and fraudulated. Well, I'm afraid you, you hit the nail on the head is because... You know, when you go back to the 70s, the concern was global cooling. And, and you know, if you actually look at the, the temperature, the, the average global temperature, what you see is that the, we were in a period called the Little Ice Age by, by climate scientists, uh, which was the coldest period since the end of the Great Ice Age 10,000 years ago. And if you actually look at glaciers' response to this cooling of the global climate, you'll see that they grew worldwide to the largest extent they had been in 10,000 years. So when we are now looking at glacier recession, we have to say, we have to recognize that we're looking at their recession from the largest they have grown in 10,000 years. And there's now evidence in hand that the glaciers have repeatedly almost disappeared and then returned again. And you have to understand that when you start talking about glacier recession, this is a process that began over a century and a half ago, you know. And if you look at the amount of CO2 that humans are dumping into the atmosphere, prior to World War II, it was insignificant. Um, not enough to where any, any 
climate scientists would argue that we were having a significant effect on the global temperature. It was not. It was during World War II and the Second World, post Second World War, with the with the you know growth of car culture and so forth that that we began dumping four, five, and six billion tons roughly of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. Bear in mind, of course, though, that cycling through the atmosphere naturally is over about 750 billion cubic tons. So we're only adding a small percentage to that, which is naturally cycling through the atmosphere. But in any case, the global warming began in the middle of the uh, 1800s. And it's just basically been continuing on with some interruptions. The last interruption was roughly between... Um, the 1940s and the 1970s. The first half of the 20th century saw a pretty significant climate rise globally of about a half a degree. Most of that has to be based upon natural phenomena because, again, we weren't doing enough to significantly change the global climate. Then what happened is with the advent of radiocarbon dating in the 1950s, the 1960s, it became apparent that glacial, interglacial oscillations were occurring much more frequently and much more rapidly than anybody had previously realized. And it also, as I mentioned earlier, became apparent by that time that the longest interglacial interval of the last roughly quarter million years was the one we're in now. Okay, So the immediate implication of that is that, well, our own interglacial period, period of interglacial warmth might be coming to an end. Well, at the same time that realization set in, we actually went into a period of more or less global cooling. Between the 1940s, the mid-1940s, and the mid-1970s, the temperature of the planet on average cooled slightly. What's interesting about that is exactly when we started pumping significant amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere, what was the, any response of the atmosphere was to cool off rather than to warm up. Well, then come the 80s, we went through a two-decade interval of climatic warming. Well, you can almost understand why um, scientists would have assumed that, you know, maybe we're headed for global cooling back in the 70s because, number one, we were what appeared to be at the end of an interglacial epoch, and two, the climate actually was cooling. The, the interesting thing, though, is that there was it was going to be impossible, difficult if not impossible, to blame uh, global cooling on human activity. Nobody was thinking in the 70s that this cooling that we were seeing around the world was caused by humans. The assumption was that it was completely natural. With the advent of global warming, though, global warming had a, the distinct advantage of being able to be uh, attributed to human activity. And so it became a... Uh, you know, a crusade for the environmental movement. Oh, we're changing the, the temperature of the planet and it's going to overheat and we're all going to die from all of these, you know, the, the vicious hurricanes that are going to be unleashed and the droughts that are going to be unleashed and all of the bad consequences and so forth. And so, you know, you've basically got a whole movement now that's entrenched into this political paradigm and they don't want to let go of that because they're not really looking at the science again. They cherry picked the science to support their their preconceived concept that humans are destroying the global uh, environment and that we are going to provoke a climate catastrophe. And a term that you often hear um, proffered in the in the circles is the tipping point. By you know adding another ten parts per million of, of a natural trace gas CO two to the atmosphere, the whole planet's going to spin into this terrible you know global catastrophe. Well. What I like to say in response to that, Vinny, is this. Okay, I think that a real tipping point is not really another 10 or 20 parts per million of CO2 added to the atmosphere. A real tipping point is, say, like when a, a mile-wide asteroid slams into the Earth moving at 30,000 miles per hour. That's a tipping point. A tipping point might be when a, you have a super volcanic eruption spewing 500 cubic kilometers of ash and dust into the global atmosphere, causing the entire planet to go dark for two or three years. That's a tipping point. Another 10 parts per million of CO2? No, I, I'm sorry, I can't quite accept that as being, quote unquote, a tipping point. Yeah, that's like a, that's like a, a, a faucet. That's, uh, it's like a dripping point, you know, rather than a tipping point, as it were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another thing, they, they don't want to talk about the fact that that four times, three to four times as many people die 
when the weather gets cold and when it gets hot. Or that a global cooling, if you look at history, the global cooling episodes have always been far more detrimental than global warming periods. Um, you know, if you look back at the at the, the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages, which began in the mid-sixth century, was a period of global cooling. And literal, literal global darkness, um, probably attributed possibly to volcanic eruptions. Uh, one theory that's uh, been presented that, that actually is plausible to me is that we had a dusting. The planet got dusted by uh, cosmic debris, uh, probably disintegrating comet. There's actually been a... a, a um, a crater discovered in the uh, off the coast of Norway that's been called Grendel that appears to date right from the historically uh, attributed date for the onset of the of the Dark Age about 540 A.D. Anyways, there was a global cooling, and um, one of the consequences of those that global cooling episode is that agriculture collapsed for several years between 536 and 540 A.D. And as a consequence of that. People became malnourished because people got malnourished, their, weak, their immune systems got weakened. And then in 542, we had the onset of the Justinian Plague, which wiped out millions of people worldwide. Then come again around the early 1300s, we had the Bubonic Plague, which again came on the heels of the first phase of cooling of the Little Ice Age when it came on. If you look at the period from about 950 A.D. to roughly 1250 A.D., this is, was the medieval warm period. And this is when, uh, you know, uh, Scandinavians were colonizing the west coast of Greenland, where it's now perennial permafrost. Um, you know, when they were had a flourishing wine industry in England, you know, where you can't really grow wine grapes now without lots of, uh, you know, lots of extra intervention. A um, lot of indications that the global temperature might have been up to a degree warmer during the middle medieval, medieval warm period. And if you look at that period, what you had was you had an expansion of human lifespan. You had an enormous expansion of human population. You had uh, a, a longer growing season, so people had more to eat. Um, and then you had society flourished, moved forward, advanced, and evolved. Then come uh, about the middle 12th century, you had the onset of the great uh, Gothic Age building boom when they built all the great cathedrals, only because they had such amounts of surplus food to eat that they could create... Um, you know, that they could support these armies of artisans and stonemasons and glaziers and engineers and carpenters to build these tremendous cathedrals. They couldn't have done anything like that during the cold of the Dark Ages. And when the cold of the Little Ice Age came on, all of that, that great wave of building and activity came to an end. And again, you had, you had um, multiple years where you had collapses of global agriculture. And in the wake of that, you had famine. In the wake of the famine, you then had disease and pestilence and bubonic plague. These are the consequences of global cooling. The consequences of global warming is uh, social advancement, flourishing of, of human society, you know, decrease in infant mortality, increase in lifespan. Not to say that there isn't a downside, because there's always a downside to any change at all. But you know, the climate is not going to stand still. Despite the fantasies of the climate change environmentalists, the climate of the planet is not going to stabilize. It's some norm, because there is no norm. You know, when you think about the oscillations between glacial and interglacial ages, where and there is the norm? If you actually look at the last two and a half million years, three quarters of the time or more, we've been in the grip of an ice age. That has been the norm for the last two and a half million years. If you go back the last 10 million years, back into the Pliocene and the Miocene, you have global warmth, much warmer than now. You have sea levels up 10, 20, 40 feet higher than now. So, I mean, who's going to define what's norm? What You know, you know what I reckon is going to happen? Norm? You know what I reckon is going to happen? We're going to have the ability to control the weather and, and the ability to manipulate and mold the weather how we want, and they're going to call it the Plasticine Era. The Plasticine Era? Yeah. Because plasticine uh -huh. can be molded and shaped how you want. I understand. I, mm. I understand. That's uh, perhaps you're right. But and what was happening case, right now? Uh, we got the, uh, the 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 chemtrail activity and, and things of that nature. Like, have you noticed um, uh, reports around the world of, of, of very strange uh, weather events, like uh, snow falling um, when it's when the temperature is well above freezing temperature? Like, there's there's no physical possibility really that it could actually turn into snow without some kind of outside influence and, and, I have and a, no i haven't really looked into that i mean i have definitely looked into um 
you know, episodes of, of unusual weather. I mean, that's one of the things when I, when I study climate change. I mean, that's one of the things that I look at. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, when you start looking at some of the weather events throughout history, there have been some really bizarre, extreme weather events, you know. Um, so it's not like what's going on now is so extreme that um, it's totally unprecedented. There have been some amazing uh, hurricanes and, and droughts and tornadoes and, and things throughout the history of, of, you know, the planet that, and even in the last few hundred years that, you know, that, that really show that to me, you know, there's, yes, there's always been these anomalies that are inexplicable. I don't know if what's going on is any different now than, than, it, than what it has been. Um, but I have actually, I've created a couple of multimedia shows just about the subject of climate change from all angles. And, and one of the things that I've documented extensively in these uh, climate change presentations is anomalous weather through the last couple of centuries. Anomalous weather, like up to the 1940s, 1950s, because of the fact that prior to that time, you know, you couldn't really blame it on humans. And, and I don't think any humans were trying to blame it on, you know, the activities of mankind. They fully accepted that some of these bizarre climate incidences were, in fact, totally natural. Mm. Well, let's talk about this after the break as well. In fact, we've we've gone well off sacred geometry as <laughs> we talk about climate change for practically an hour. So I think we'll uh, we'll 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 leave that, put a pin in it, okay. and we'll come back after the break at the Vinnieeastwoodshow.com. Randall Carlson, Sacred Geometry International dot info, ladies and gentlemen. Back in a minute. Welcome back, everybody, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. We're broadcasting live on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Five days a week i do very much hope that everybody appreciates the work that we do here uh, at american freedom radio and uh, just just remember of course there is a massive economic crisis going on uh, in the truth of community on a constant basis so if anybody is capable of shelling out five bucks of some description go to the vinnieeastwoodshow.com and click the donate button and if you don't like me specifically, uh, and of which I could totally understand, go to AmericanFreedomRadio.com and click on the donate banner there and give them five bucks. And it, see, it all makes the world go round. Thank you very much for all your contributions as well. It would be nice if we could get some uh, some new subscribers uh, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. I hit up to about 80 of them before PayPal cancelled my account and left me with nothing. And that took me like three years to get up. So if you listen to this broadcast, please, please subscribe and, and make a regular donation uh, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show just to keep us going as we are. My very special guest, Randall Carlson from Sacred Geometry International, either .com or .info, it matters not, goes to the same place anyway. So, Randall, you've been around for quite a number of years, and uh, I've been having conversations with my uh, with my guitarist uh, Mikhail about about this, about the uh, one of the best decades to ever exist, the seventies. Um, the reason why the 70s is one of the best decades is because it's the only decade I've ever heard of for which any activity or any kind of things that you do during that decade are excused by the fact that it was that decade. You know, oh man, I took a lot of acid, but hey, it was the 70s. Hey man, I, we, we, we traded wives and, and, and things like that and, and, and uh, had wild orgies and stuff, but hey, it was the 70s. Any kind yeah, of debauched uh, humor, humor or, uh, or, or anything can be uh, completely explained away instantly by simply saying that it was the 70s. I love that. Yeah, well, it was quite a time to be uh, certainly in my 20s and being single. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll say that, yes, the 70s. I did a lot of things that I don't do anymore, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but I had a good time doing it. Luckily, they got over, you know, they, it's a good thing that the 70s didn't last for 20 or 30 years. Yeah, I know. You, oh. you could imagine the kind of shape our society would be in now. Oh, wait, no, it's I actually know. already in pretty bad shape, isn't it? <laughs> well, though, you know, in some ways, respects, though, it's interesting because it was, um, it was a time of relative freedom, at least in America. You know, you were, there, was a, there was an interval 
you know, I think after Nixon got discredited, he kind of, when, once he got hounded out of office, he took a lot of that police state command and control authoritarian mentality with him. And, you know, the Vietnam War was ended. And, uh, you know, I think people just said, hey, you know, let's party. And there was a degree of relative freedom and, of course, a lot of hedonism. But in most of the folks that I know who were in the middle of that, you know, sort of, you know, eventually outgrew it um, or they, you know, or they didn't last. Um, but then uh, there was a time there during the 70s where, um, you know, I think I think it was kind of for me, it was like the last burst of freedom in America before the onset of authoritarianism came along again in the 80s. And we had the drug war and, you know, no-knock warrants and all of the things that went along with that. And, you know, and it's just progressed, progressively gotten worse since then. Um, and it's just too bad because there's a whole generation of Americans now that kind of have forgotten what freedom actually tastes like. Because um, they've grown up, you know, in the last 20 years where basically the government has been the... Uh, the dominant factor. See, when I was a kid uh, in the 50s, you know, there was still a considerable amount of autonomy amongst people as a, as a rule. Um, just in my profession, for example, you know, my father built 200 houses without ever getting permission from anybody. You know, now I have to go through a long convoluted process of, you know, bureaucratic minefields in order to get a permit to do a project, you know. Um, you know, and, and that's just, you know, one example. I mean, there are thousands of examples of how we're losing our freedom on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, I'm one of those who believes that, you know, freedom is second only to life itself in terms of its preciousness and its value. And uh, I certainly do want to see us get back to the idea that, hey, you know what, leave people alone and for the most part people will do all right. I like to say, you know, if, if you have a different... Um, if you, if you want something different from the state than what I want, then you have an agenda. And what do I want from the state? I really don't want anything from the government other than the right to be left alone. And I'll take care of myself, my family, my friends, my local community, my business, and we'll do just fine. But that was once the ideal of America, and that has been pretty much, for the most part, completely lost. Till we had the rise of... Um, you know, sort of an alternative, you know, back in 2008 with the running of Ron Paul, who was basically trying to, you know, educate people about, hey, wait a second, you know, you, you've kind of lost your way here. and we've, We're descending rapidly into totalitarianism here. And it's time to take a time out and, and you know, ask about, you know, which road do we want to go down from here? And um, I think a lot of people got hoodwinked in the last two elections thinking that there was going to be some significant change that occurred in America, and it hasn't happened, other than just uh, a further erosion of our freedom and our autonomy as individuals and as local communities and so forth. So that doesn't really much have much to do, I think, with safety geometry, but it's, it's an important part of where we, where we need to go from here. I think that you know, sacred geometry is a way of reconnecting with our past. Um, you know, we, we learned that there were ways that our, our predecessors on the planet discovered ways that they could introduce a little bit greater degree of harmony into their daily lives. And if nothing else, that's what sacred geometry gives us, is, is the ability to introduce an element of harmony. Because, you know, the, what the hermetic dictum is, as above, so below. Yeah. You've heard that, the old alchemical. Well, I mean, they were practicing this in a literal sense by creating uh, an infrastructure down here below that reflected the heavens above. And certainly as somebody who grew up in a rural country environment, um, you know, I was much, much more aware of, of the night sky. You know, I was very fascinated in early age with astronomy for the simple reason that I could walk out my front door and there was the stars brilliant in the sky because I lived in a rural environment. And, um, and then, of course, living in Minnesota, the, the change of the seasons was quite pronounced and always extremely fascinating to, to you know, participate in this, this changing of the seasons, the, the cyclical changing through the course of the year was always just almost 
entrancing to me to, to experience that firsthand. And I've noticed, you know, having lived here in the urban area of, of near Atlanta, Georgia, which is a very large, sprawling urban area, and lots of young people who have no experience outside of that, that the urban experience growing up in the city, uh, you know, basically going into the government schools, government, you know, indoctrination factories to me is what they are. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of like lost touch with a very fundamental and important strata of reality, if you will. Um, you know, in, in coming out of post-World War II and being part of the post-World War II baby generation, you know, I grew up where basically people had a very much live and let live attitude, you know, leave us alone and we'll take care of our own, um, you know, and, and it's very self-reliant. You know, that was sort of one of the, you know, people in Minnesota were hardy. They were settlers from Scandinavia, and, and they had very much of this kind of self-reliant attitude. And I've watched that erode, and I think that's to our detriment, because we've gotten so far off track with, with the things that are really significant that I think that our predecessors were on to, and realizing that, you know, that we are part of a much larger picture and there are forces at work that would dwarf anything that we do. I mean, that, I think, is kind of the upshot of what we were talking about in the last two segments and how we could sort of bring that discussion back to this idea that there were um, these models of how society should evolve that, of course, have always been betrayed. I mean, that's the history of the evolution of society. But nonetheless, we can still see in there these constant efforts to establish some kind of a some kind of an advance over what had existed previously. Um, you know, the idea of democracy, the idea of, of republicanism in the true sense of the word, you know, the idea of individual freedom. Um, but all of that, you know, when you look back, for example, in the Middle Ages, which I think is a very important period of history that we can learn a lot from, you know, this is when we see the last great um, establishment of the principles of sacred geometry in society, the building of these great abbeys and Gothic cathedrals were pure expressions of, of the principles of sacred geometry. And the idea there is that there is this geometry of life and that if we can recreate our world to harmonize or to conform to some extent with that geometry of life, that it'll create an environment in which we will be much more likely to prosper. And, and what's happened now in you know, most of our urban uh, environments is, is essentially you don't get a sense of harmony when you go into the modern urban environment. What you get is a sense of chaos. I, um, I don't know. I, I think you get a, uh, a sense of harmony, meaning you get harmed and you moan about it. Yeah, exactly. You get harmed and you moan about it. That's, that's exactly right. And um, there's so much I think we can learn from our predecessors, both from their, their successes and their mistakes. Uh, but as I was talking about earlier, you know, we see that period, that medieval warm period, you know, we see society really moving forward and we see, you know, the advancement of knowledge and we see the advancement of, of the human condition. And then when we, when we look at, um, we, we see this reflected again when we go back Randall. to what was referred yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know, we're, we're about to end the show here. We've only got about uh, 10 or 20 seconds. So I apologize, but I'm going to have to oh. cut you right off. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, and I, and I definitely want to have you on the show again, by the way. Um, but, ladies and gentlemen, if you are on Skype, uh, just jump on that Skype uh, right now and uh, add me on Skype, Vincent.Eastwood. We're going to have an after-the-show conversation starting now. Mm -hmm.